Hey there, I'm excited to announce this to you today. This is what you've been waiting for in your spiritual quest. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I'm finally ready to announce it that it's ready to go. It's the Grief to Growth Community Circle. Now, this is a sanctuary where like-minded souls are united in their journey through grief and towards personal transformation. It's more than just a place. It's a beginning. It's a commitment to growth and understanding. Here you're finding not just a community, but you're entering a circle of trust and depth. You're going to engage with interactive coursework. You'll dive into exclusive podcast episodes and partake in discussions that illuminate the path from mourning to empowerment. This is a realm where every question is honored and every individual's journey is validated. To be part of this exclusive circle, visit us at grieftogrowth.com slash community or look for the chat icon at the bottom of every page on the main website. Remember, the entry is a privilege because I want to ensure that every member is as dedicated and genuine as you are. You must apply to join, but the journey within is worth every step. So go ahead and join us today. Check it out, grieftogrowth.com slash community, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hi there. Welcome to Grief to Growth Podcast. Your host is Brian Smith, spiritual seeker, best-selling author, grief survivor, and life coach. Brian believes that the worst tragedies of life provide the greatest opportunity for growth. Brian says he was planted, not buried, and he is here to help you grow where you've been planted by the difficulties in life. In each episode, Brian and his guests will share what has helped them to survive and thrive. It is his sincere hope this episode helps you today. Hey, everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me Dr. Joshua Black. And I'm really excited to interview Dr. Black because he's uh, his field of expertise is a very unique field. Um, he's a grief researcher, a speaker, an author, a consultant, online course instructor, and he's the host of the Grief Dreams podcast. He's focused all of his master's and PhD re- research in psychology on investigating dreams and bereavement, also known as grief dreams and continuing bonds for many types of loss, including prenatal loss and pet loss. Most of his academic research and publications have specifically been on the dreams of the deceased. Dr. Black is considered one of the world's leading academic experts in grief dreams. Due to the lack of academic research in this field, Dr. Black has focused his efforts on raising awareness on grief dreams through doing talks, interviews, and developing an online grief dreams course. Additionally, developed a grief dreams website, and runs several social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, at at Grief Dreams. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Joshua Black. Well, thank you for having me today. Yeah, it's really, I'm really excited to have you here today. We had to move this a couple of times because of uh, some some things with our calendars. But I'm really looking forward to talking about this, this field that people, I think, know a little bit about, but not a lot about. So how did you get involved in researching Grief Dreams? Like it's it's a very interesting story that you know it came really after my dad died. I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. That was my focus for my entire life. I like since I was a kid, I remember my dad telling me how that that was the best job to have because it has a good pension and it's pretty well paying paid in Canada anyways, that's where I'm from. Mm-hmm. So I spent my whole life really going towards that. And then the fourth year, it took five years to finish my undergrad, the fourth year my dad died and it changed absolutely everything. And so Hmm. it was the first time I really experienced a death, a significant loss in my life. And it was completely devastating for me. Like I remember getting that phone call. He was supposed to pick me up. It was around my birthday and we're supposed to go to a hockey game together. And he just Mm -hmm. never showed up. And so I just thought he slept in. He had some health issues where it um, minimized what he could do. And so I just figured, oh, maybe it was just, you know, he had migraine or something. He just couldn't can come so Mm. I didn't think anything of it two days later I get a phone call from my aunt who basically said that you know they found my father dead uh, in his apartment and Mm. and he was just collapsed on the floor and for me like the amount of emotion that came out was so scary because one of the reasons because I was a I still am a guy but (laughs) I was um, at that time I really I didn't feel comfortable crying so I tend right. to not cry. Right. I don't know when the last time I cried, probably when I was a kid. And so those emotions are coming out. I haven't felt those in for, for a very long time. And they mm-hmm. just kept coming. The tears kept coming. And like the the negative thoughts and the of, of the future of like not being able to do stuff with them and not having mm-hmm. any more memories. 
Mm. It really scared me in a lot of ways. And I had to sit with that. And I sat with that for about three days. I, I decided to do a eulogy, which was interesting in itself. <laughs> I, mm. I recommend everyone to do that. But yeah, I kept crying on stage for a good like five minutes before I could speak. But the emotions, like I couldn't believe how much emotion was coming out. Mm. You know, you know, with that. And one of the reasons I should say too, because me and my dad had a rocky relationship throughout our entire life. And one of the reasons was he had a he drank a lot to cope with his emotions. And so he had a lot of trauma he never actually worked through. Mm. And so I was scared of him for the majority of my life. And we just never, you know, clicked kind of thing until mm. after my mom and him got divorced. And it was about that year and a half there, that's when we started rebuilding our relationship. And he acted a lot differently to me. I think, and I think there's a, a story in that for me because I think that's where the pain was coming from. Because mm. if it was, if I always thought if he died, maybe you know, two years earlier, I wouldn't have felt like that. I would have been like, okay, you know, because I still had a lot of resentment, a lot of pain um, for him. But because of the friendship that we're really building, and he was becoming the father I always wanted, kind of thing. Wow. As yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. And then for him to just die like that, it was it was such a shock. And it brought out all those all those emotions. I remember wanting to, after I get got the news, I wanted to do something special for him. And I was actually really considering dropping out of school and going to Israel, which was a trip he wanted to take me on the following year. And I was really grateful looking back now. I had a partner who calmed me down and was pretty supportive to say, you know, let's wait until you finish. You only have one year left of school. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, finish that. And then you can decide on if you should do that or not. And so I'm so happy for that because it, it's amazing the irrational decisions we can make, you know, when yeah. we're in a state of grief. So yeah. I was just so happy I had, I had, you know, so some support around me at that time. So anyways, mm -hmm. I did the eulogy. I went back to school the next day and all my sadness was gone, but the crazy thing was all my happiness and joy was gone too. And so I was living in this weird gray state where like there was no color left in the world. And I was in that state for about three months and I couldn't tell you, I tried everything, you know, nothing really gave me joy. They it used to. And so I just thought, Oh, this is life. Now this is what mm -hmm. grief is. This is life. And it wasn't until I had a dream of my father that everything changed. And so this is where my love for that topic really started. And so the dream was, I was just uh, in my room. It was very, it wasn't like a bizarre dream at all. Like mm -hmm. I was in my, so in the dream, I was in my room and everything in my room was the same way it was in waking life, which is, mm -hmm. you know, very unique in itself. At that time, I had a lot of clutter everywhere. So that is amazing <laughs> detail to <laughs> be able to, to yeah. capture. And then um, a lot of other dreams that I have are, you know, you tend to be like, you know, weird stuff going on. So you'd wake up and you're like, oh, that was a dream. But this mm -hmm. was, it, it was very realistic in that way. Mm -hmm. I saw my dad at the end of my room and he looked so healthy. Like I never, like it wasn't even a memory because I never even seen him like this before. His energy was very light. As I said, he had a lot of trauma and issues going on in waking mm -hmm. life. So he always had this heaviness to him where he just never dealt with his stuff. And, but here he felt so light, like his energy was just so beautiful and he just mm -hmm. looked so healthy. And I walked up to him and I said, I'm going to miss you acknowledging the loss. And mm -hmm. I said that I loved him. And then we hugged and I woke up. And when I woke up, it was the most crazy experience because everything changed. The color was back into the world. Like, I don't know. I didn't know. I said, I remember sitting at the edge of my bed and saying, what was that? Hmm. I wasn't interpreting the dream, but I felt something changed in me because of the dream. Hmm. And I still sit in the mystery of that moment. And I hear it a lot from other people where the dream itself changes people. It's not really the interpretation that can help in many different ways, but the dream itself had the power to change like where I was in my grief. And so I was able to have this joy back and I was able to regulate my emotions. I could have tears, you know, when I thought about them and stuff. So it was just really a beautiful, whatever that was, a very beautiful point in my life because I don't know where it'd be. I'd probably still be in the gray and I would probably be doing something differently because of that dream. I then finished, you know, school within probably I think six months after that. And I applied to be in teacher's college, which was mm -hmm. my goal the whole time. Mm -hmm. And the moment I got an interview to, to get in, I just felt something wasn't right. And so I turned it down, which was, for me, looking back, one of the craziest decisions I've made because I had nothing going. I had no plan B. <laughs> there, wow. is no, there is no plan B 
I was going off a of feeling and especially after grief, I don't know how wise that was because that feeling could have been misleading right. in many ways. But, you know, looking back, maybe because my dad was dead, I didn't have that pressure to do it, that unconscious kind of pressure. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think there's just another path that was just being led for let out for me. I just didn't know what that was. And that following year was just as scary as the grief because I couldn't find work. And when I did find work, it wasn't fulfilling. I'm like, is this life? You know, is this life after, you know, doing your your undergrad? I'm like, mm-hmm. this this isn't what they told me. Yeah. <laughs> they say, yeah. Every, all the jobs I wanted, you need a master's for. I'm like, I don't want to do a master's. <laughs> right. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do any more school. And so I so I worked, you know, these odd end jobs and I want to find some meaning. So I went and volunteered at a hospice to help with the bereaved. And I did you know, one-on-one support and group support and um, group support. Mm-hmm. And they had these questions about these dreams. So some people were sharing these positive dreams. Other people were asking questions why they didn't have dreams. Other people want to know what these negative dreams meant. And, you know, I didn't really know. I didn't know much about dream research at that time. Mm-hmm. And so I looked at the research. I still had an account from my school. So I looked in, at the publications that were available and there wasn't anything when it came to these types of dreams that I could provide them to give them any kind of understanding. And I was really shocked by that because, you know, I thought, you know, most stuff's researched a lot, you know, right. and a lot of people are just almost like cleaning up the trail, like the, the, the laneways pa- like paved. And they're just like every research study is just moving a little like an inch forward. Exactly. But there was like nothing. It wasn't even a dirt road I could really go off of. <laughs> and so there was, so I, I couldn't give him an answer. And then I had this moment where I was like, could I like because I knew the impact it had for me and their questions really interested me. Mm -hmm. I thought, like, could I research this topic? Like, is that a possibility for me? And then in my mind, I'm like, well, you have to know stats. You have to know research methodology. I'm like, I don't want to know any of this. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't want to be a researcher. And for a lot, so I was really scared to pursue that that goal. But finally, I, I settled down the nerves and said, you know what, you know, why not give it a go? What's the worst that can happen? You know, I, I don't get in or I go and I fail. At least I tried. And I can say I tried, yeah. you know, like, and so that's really, so I had to per, like have courage to even like pursue this. And I did. And what amazing was that I actually got through and like without some challenges, the guy say, I want to quit many times and the support of, you know, my friends and the people who, um, follow the topic and mm-hmm. my platform were really helpful and encouraged me to how much this was needed. Mm-hmm. And so when I was at the like the lowest points of my, I guess, you know, master's or PhD, I had that to go off and say, you know, we got to keep persevering this, you know, like we got to keep doing this. And so it spent a lot of time, extra time. I felt like I was like two years behind everyone else, tell you the truth, because everyone wanted to be a researcher. Like when I asked my colleagues, that are in their masters, they like, oh, I knew like when I started university. So like they already had this plan and so they really valued, you know, stats and research methodology. Which mm-hmm. to me, I want to be a elementary school teacher, which you know, I took those courses, but right. I didn't, you know, like I just got enough to get the good grade. Like I didn't retain any of that information. So I had to learn all that over again. And then when I got my PhD, it was less like everyone <laughs> was like super smart. And I had to really sort of you know up my game on that too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but I made it through, you know, like at the end of the day, I made it through. And by the end of that fourth year, I was at par with everyone else, if not, you know, in the sense of what I was doing a little mm-hmm. bit. My career trajectory was a little different because a lot of people wanted to be to do a post talk and do all this other stuff and want to get into other areas. I'm like, this is the only topic on the research I get. I don't want to be, be bothered with anything else other than this. And so I really directed a lot of my focus on doing talks and setting up the website and the podcast mm-hmm. rather than, you know, do more research studies outside of my field, which a lot of my colleagues are doing at that time. So I just had a different kind of, I think, plan on why I was researching the topic and then what I was going to do with it as I move forward. So that's where it all sort of happened. And when I was in my master's and PhD, those years, that's when I really realized how vast a topic is. Like before, I was just going off a couple of questions. Mm. But once I got in and I started seeing the different biases, the different ways people see these dreams, and I started collecting the dreams and doing the research, I'm like, wow, this field is phenomenal. Mm. And it really, you know, changed the way I viewed these dreams in many ways, but also the way I approached them with people. And I think that's one of the most important things of why I'm doing these talks is to validate the importance of this within the grief journey, but also how to use discernment and provide a safe space for people to actually share these experiences. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I think it's it is such important work that that again, I don't know if there's been much research done on it. I haven't heard of any 
And I know that, you know, when we have these dreams and some of us do, and frankly, some of us say they don't, everybody wants them. You know, I, I work a lot with parents who have lost children and we're like, why can't I get more dream visits? I want to, I want a dream visit. You know, uh, it's, it's such a, it's a, but people were like, so I want to just back up for us and, and maybe you can explain it. What is actually a dream? Because we don't, we know we go to sleep. We have this thing that we feel, but what is a dream? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey there, something I want to tell you about today. My podcast platform, Buzzsprout, has recently made it easier for me to allow you to support me financially. Go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash subscribe. That's grief, the number two, growth.com slash subscribe. And once you're there, you can sign up to support me financially. Now you can do it for as little as $3 a month or of course, as much as you'd like. If you do that, you'll get access to bonus episodes and you'll see those in the regular feed. They'll have a lock on them. But when you become a subscriber, you'll actually get access to your own private feed and you'll be able to listen to the regular podcast along with the bonus podcast for the subscribers. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for sharing the podcast. And I want to thank those of you who support me financially. Have a great day and on to the episode. A dream is really anything thought, feeling, or scene that you sort of remember when you wake up. And so that's sort of the definition of a dream. A lot of people think when it comes to dreams, it only happens in REM state, but it's not actually true. Mm -hmm. We actually dream throughout our sleep. So in non-REM and REM, there are differences in the quality of those dreams. So Mm -hmm. usually non-REM dreams are more bland. And in the REM dreams, you get more of the emotion that's going on. But at the, you know, near the end of night, it's not as, as true. And the other interesting thing is in REM, you tend to remember more dreams. So a lot of people would say, if you remember a dream, it's probably from REM, because if you wake someone up 80% of the time, they're going to be dreaming in non-REM, it's around 50% of the time. And so there's just a little difference there. We don't know where these grief dreams uh, fit in personally, like you Mm -hmm. have to catch it in the lab to sort of understand where these powerful dreams come in. It's probably REM, but you know, like at the end of the day, we just don't know. And I think that's the mystery of this topic because they do act differently than other dreams, a typical dream anyways. So there mm-hmm. is this mystery of what actually is going on in the brain when these happen. And so, yeah, that's, uh, so that's basically a, a nutshell of the dreams. And I should tell you some about dream research. So when it comes to dreams, 10% of the population doesn't remember dreaming, even right. though for our knowledge, everyone is dreaming. It's just the remembering is the issue. And mm-hmm. so on average, one to two dreams a week, the public would say they would remember. And you can, you know, change that based on, um, which is kind of, we can talk about that more, but you mm-hmm. can increase your frequency of dreams as you move forward just by valuing the topic. So, you know, keeping a dream journal, listen to this and, you know, talking about your dreams with others. Mm-hmm. If you're really trying to tell your mind that these are important now, our culture right. is really bad at valuing dreams so why yeah. would you remember them right and so there's different ways to remember dreams a little bit better mm-hmm. uh, we can go over that you know if, we, if you want to but yeah. then uh, right now okay so <laughs> well I, I do I actually don't yeah. I want to interject here because my wife was one of those people for a long time would say I don't think I dream because I don't mm-hmm. remember my dreams yeah but then after my daughter passed and my daughter other daughter was talking about dreams and I was talking about dreams and we do all these reading about dreams stuff now my wife is remembering her dreams a lot more often. And I, yeah. it goes to what you're saying, that, that valuing the dream makes a difference. Yeah, it, it's, it's so amazing too. And like the more you, you value it and the more you write through your dreams down, the more you can have and like w- the more you just remember anyways. Mm-hmm. And so like I remember like just trying this out, like research has shown that just by doing that, it increases your recall rate. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I usually have, you know, maybe three dreams a week. And I remember starting doing this and within a month I was having three dreams a night that I could remember. Mm-hmm. And so I, I finally said, you know, this is enough. I, this is because it kept waking me up and I'd write down. And like, <laughs> so finally, I'm like, I'm only writing down like the ones that I feel are more meaningful. Mm-hmm. And so then my the the rate of recall actually decreased. So you can increase and decrease based on that, too. Right. So interesting. Wow. Yeah. Which is really interesting. And so what I want to sort of say when it comes to dreams, most people so on average, um, most people will have negative dreams. And that's just because a lot of times we carry our stresses, our worries to bed. Mm -hmm. or we're watching the news or we're watching a horror film or something that is going to be creeping into our dreams. Mm -hmm. And after trauma, what's interesting is that these dreams become even more consistently negative. And so you would think after grief would be very similar in the sense that people are going to be having a lot of nightmares and negative dreams. If you just look at the pandemic right now, um, there has been research to show that there's been an increase in nightmares, increase of negative images. 
hmm. for people. And you can just sort of see how that reflects the stress of an individual. And given a pandemic, it's a very stressful time for many reasons, financial, they like said you have the grief stuff, someone dies, you have work, you have catching the virus and, and your own death and mortality, mm-hmm. your loved ones, you know, mortality. There's so much stress people are dealing with, even having to homeschool your kids. Like, I can't imagine what that would be like, but you know, like you're going to bed with all that. And so dreams reflect our waking life and people just need to understand that connection because there's a lot of clues and a lot of things that you can learn from your dreams if you know how to sort of understand your dream language. And I think that's the most important thing is that everyone has their own unique language when it comes to the dreams. As much as we want a quick fix and we want to just Google, you know, what does an elephant mean? And then take that to mean what your dream means. It's that's mm-hmm. not the best way of doing it. You're just going to sell yourself short and you'll probably be led in a wrong direction. Mm-hmm. So like everyone's like symbol of an elephant would be different, but there's also a story that goes along with the elephant. It's very rare. You just have an elephant and you wake up. You're usually riding the elephant, you're going around you're meeting people or whatnot. Right. So there's a story that goes along that helps people understand what the, the dream itself is trying to convey to the dreamer. Sometimes it's very passive and it's just you, you know, working through the emotions of the day. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's, you know, there's a lot of problem solving in there and basically allowing you to see what you're working on still, because the mind is so great at tricking you to think you're further than you are in, in life. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's so many times. I'll give, I'll give an example of this just in the pandemic. Yeah. You know when they're like, that, there was that craze that everyone was buying toilet paper? Yeah. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So around that time, I was like, oh, I got this. I'm okay. I'm not too stressed. You know, like I, I had a smile on my face. I was going through life. And then and I had this really crazy nightmare where I was in my, the house I grew up in and, sh- and there was a chandelier being taken down. And when it was taken down, I took some of the the glass um, and I started eating it. And then I having I started having like a panic attack because I realized the glass was stuck in my throat and I couldn't mm. get it out. Mm-hmm. I woke up with a, just a deep sweat. Like, like for me, like the last time I had that was probably like maybe seven, eight years ago. Like I nightmares are I pretty cognitive of my emotions in waking life, mm-hmm. and so I tend to work on them in waking life, so it doesn't have to affect me so much in, in my uh, my dream world. But anyway, so that was such a big trigger for me that there was something I didn't, I wasn't catching, I wasn't seeing. Mm -hmm. So I really had to look at that because I'm like, I thought it was fine. Like, what's going on? And Mm -hmm. then I realized like, okay, let's, if this was someone else's dream, (laughs) how can we look at this? I'm like, okay, what's a chandelier? Well, a chandelier provides light to a a large space. Mm -hmm. I go, what's similar to that that's going on in my life right now? And so I started thinking, I'm like, oh, the news does that. The news provides stories to like a country right and so it's mm. a, for a large space so i'm like so i'm if i'm breaking it off i must be reading a lot of it and ingesting it but what i'm ingesting is actually causing me great pain and suffering i don't know about it i was like this makes sense because what i was doing at that time as much as i felt calm i was reading a lot of news throughout the day mm-hmm. and that was actually uh, very detrimental to my mental health and i didn't even know it and so I really had to take a step back and say, okay, why are we looking at the news? Oh, it feels safe. How many times you need to look at it to feel safe? And I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, you know, once or twice, if it's going to happen, I bet you it's going to be like the headliner. You don't need to go on to like, you know, 10 different articles right, <laughs> to understand right. toilet paper is running out. Like, you just, <laughs> like yeah. you just, right. And so I made a list. So I'm like, okay, how can I actively problem solve this? I'm like, okay, what do I need to feel safe? And so, you know, you get some extra food and that sort of stuff. And like, is there anything else that you need? And it's like, no. So then, okay. So mm-hmm. then the, the need to, to look at the news so often wasn't as um, important for me. Mm-hmm. And so it was just maybe once or twice in the morning, I'd look at an article and that was it. I wouldn't look in at night. So that was a, the big thing. Like, dude, like I really stopped that. And I never had an experience like that since I haven't had a nightmare since that day. So it's just really understanding that, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that we can gain about ourselves. I always like to say dreams can be our best friend who is, you know, who can tell you the truth when you don't want to hear it. And I think that's sort of, you know, what a best friend's supposed to be anyways, is to really yeah. give you the heads up and when you're off the off off your rocker and and thinking that you're going north, but you're really going south. So is the dream our subconscious trying to communicate to our conscious mind? Is that what it is? You'd think, yeah, right. But mm-hmm. a lot of those other people who have different theories of, you know, based on their religion and based on their beliefs mm-hmm. of the afterlife and stuff, they may see it as differently. 
but yeah, for, for me, it's just like, it's a, a guidance. If it comes from inside or outside of me, it doesn't really matter. Like, I'm not too concerned. I'm like, yeah. I'm just going to, I'm just going to use it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good point. That's an excellent point. You know, because the thing is, you know, as we talk about dream visits, you know, people will say, well, I, I just have my normal dreams and then I have my nightmares and then I have my grief dreams or my, my dream visits. And they'll say, it's a totally different quality of experience. It's kind of like the way you described the dream with your father and, it, and you wake up and you feel there. It's, it's, it reminds me when people have NDEs, when they say it just, it changed my entire perspective on everything. Yeah. And many of those dreams can be like that. And it's also, you know, it's important to say, so we talk about these positive dreams a lot. And I think a lot of topic, a lot of the conversation does go there. But there's a lot of negative dreams that also happen that also have very similar qualities to some of the positive dreams. They're very vivid. They're very real. They're one on one. Mm -hmm. They may not give you a positive feeling, but they stay with you for your entire life, too. So um, sometimes a lot of people who are spiritual take those as a haunting. And there's mm -hmm. cultures that believe that that is a negative visitation. So as much as a lot of, you know, press goes to these positive dreams, there is a lot of negative dreams. And mm -hmm. just in my study, I just sort of state. So when I looked at sort of how frequent these these are in just the general public i found that's one of the amazing things i found was like how common they are so after spousal loss within the first year or two it was 86 percent of people had a dream of the deceased after pet loss it was 78 percent and after prenatal loss it was 58 percent and then mm. there was a study done with children 55 percent had a dream after their parent died. And so it's it, when you start looking at those numbers, you realize how common these actually are. Mm -hmm. Then when you sort of look at, are they positive or negative experiences? Because if you remember when we talked about just how common negative dreams are in general, then after trauma, you would think a lot of dreams after grief would be negative too. So especially mm -hmm. with the deceased in it. Mm -hmm. But as you're saying, this is where it gets interesting because it goes against typical dream research that most of these dreams are positive. So mm -hmm. when you ask someone, you know, um, the content, if you've ever had a positive dream and you sort of give a, a layout on what that means, mm -hmm. around over 90% of people will say they have at least one positive dream of the deceased. When it goes to negative, around 30%. And of those 30%, what's interesting is that those individuals will also have a positive dream at some point. And mm -hmm. so what it says to me is probably is going on is that people are having more negative dreams in the beginning. And as they work through their trauma and their grief, they'll have more of these positive dreams moving forward. We don't know that for sure. We need to do mm -hmm. more longitudinal research for that. But that is um, what I've heard on my podcast a lot and what I've just heard with talking to other people. But yeah, there's something there. And I think within so within those beautiful dreams, so they're acting differently than normal. And as you said, like a lot of them have this very beautiful space that is being provided of just love and peace. Mm -hmm. Like it is absolutely amazing. Like the deceased will say amazing, like really wise stuff. <laughs> they really help the dream out in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, to feel loved, to deal with some of the problems they're facing. But just the presence of love is one of the things I find is the most remarkable because a lot of times we seek that in life and never achieve it because we have so many worries and so much fear that is just under the surface. Mm -hmm. But in this dream, it's like none of that matters. It's like all you have is this space of love and what that can do to someone. And so when we when I look at my dream, yeah, I, I realize the importance of being able to say goodbye to my father because his death was sudden. I realize that be, um, saying I love you was an important aspect of that dream mm -hmm. because I never said that to him and probably since I was six. So it's something that I needed to say that I never got a chance to say. Um, well, he never said it to me too, so let's not put the blame on me. <laughs> right, right. No, I understand. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the third thing was this piece that – Peace in the dream was different than any other dream I had. Even the dreams that are positive I have don't have that level of peace in them. So there's something else going on that's probably very beneficial to us as we move forward through grief. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I was as we're doing this or talking about this, I was thinking about recollection of dreams. We talked about how you can actually recall more dreams, but do we have any idea why we recall some dreams and don't recall other dreams or why some people seem to recall a lot more than, than other people do? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi there. I'm really excited to tell you about my latest ebook. It's four lessons that you can learn from the near-death experience without going through all the trouble of dying to learn them. 
I've been studying NDEs for several years now. I am completely convinced that not only are they 100% real, but that there's some very universal wisdom that we can get from the near-death experience. And I've distilled that down in this book into four short lessons. And I've also given you all the reasons why I believe the NDEs are absolutely real. So go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash NDE lessons to pick it up for free www.grief the number two growth.com slash NDE lessons. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, when it comes to dream recall, there are theories out there. Because we can't see each dream, it's very hard to understand why I remember certain dreams over others, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to this the deceased. A lot of people will say, you know, you remember um, dreams because the vividness of it. So the more vivid a dream mm-hmm. or the more emotional a dream is. Um, would be different factors. If it's in REM, you may have a better, if you're waking up in REM, you may have a better chance of catching that because REM is very similar to our waking state. Uh, okay. And so it could be, you know, that. But yeah, so there's a little, there's still a lot of mystery on it. But when it comes to the East dreams, it's very interesting because they tend to come up at very important times in people's lives. And so I'm not sure if they're just not remembering the dreams or they're just not occurring, right? That's a, a question that we won't know until we be able to see dreams in general. It could be people are dreaming of the deceased more than they're actually remembering it. And that's interesting. So then then it's like, why are we remembering certain dreams at certain points in our life uh, over others? Mm -hmm. We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H dot com, or text GROWTH, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now, back to Grief to Growth. And, yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting because uh, in the, the community I run, a lot of people believe that we actually leave our bodies every night, and we basically astral travel, and we meet with our guides and our loved ones and stuff like that, and we don't recall that. So we're, we're, we're kind of back and forth between, you know, two worlds. And so when we, you know, have these, these grief dreams, we call them dream visits that we believe they were actually with, you know, our, our loved one again. Um, but as, with the grief dreams, are, have you noticed any like commonalities with the dreams versus regular dreams? And I'll give you some examples for me. It seems like they're usually the ones I have, they're really short. They're usually not, they're not very long. And when I would see my daughter, I would always know she's not supposed to be here. So I would get very excited because I, I would, you would realize that, you know, this isn't supposed to be happening. And then um, it would be somewhat lucid because I would know I was dreaming and then I, I wouldn't want to wake up. But I would always I would get excited and I'd wake myself up. So these are some of the things that I went through. Is, is that normal? Do other people have that? I've, I've heard that. Yeah, they definitely do seem shorter than other dreams, even just the word count that I've collected, like I've collected over a thousand dreams. Mm-hmm. And just when you compare that with um, other dream research, it tends to be a little shorter, but that also could be, you know, what people are writing because I, when I s- captured the data, I didn't go after a dream sample, which mm-hmm. most people would in their research. I went after a grief sample. So a lot of people you would assume are not dream enthusiasts. So they're not, you know, wanting to talk about their dreams. So maybe that's the reason why it's a little shorter because they just didn't add enough detail mm-hmm. to the dream. They sort of just cut to the chase of maybe what was most important to them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we still have to do more research on that. But yeah, a lot of people will say that, you know, they'll know the deceased is dead or they'll know that they're dreaming. It's not as common as as I think, um, like like for me, like I knew my dad was dead, but I wasn't lucid in the dream. Okay. Right? Like I didn't realize it was a dream in that moment. A lot of people are like that where they could acknowledge the person's dead, but they won't say this is a dream and become that lucid um what was the other one you were saying well i was saying it's short it's lucid and then i was for me i would like always get excited about seeing her and i would wake up and i and i didn't want to so i'm like yeah so i started actually trying to when i was in it say okay just don't get so excited yeah 
<laughs> hey, that's just love right there. That's just excitement. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it, the dream may have ended even if you didn't get excited. But at the end of the day, it's just something to smile at. But that's how much love you have, you know, for your daughter to be able to see her and for you to sort of take it as a visit. It just it makes it that much more special to you believing that it was her. Right. And so, you know, like there's just something to smile at and say, oh, all right. OK, like like how can you change that without like trying to decrease the I don't know. Like I think that is one of the most important parts of the dream is just feeling that. And that's just love coming to the surface. You yeah. know? Well, like you said, there is that and, and you can't really even describe the feeling of love, but it's one of those things, you know, it when you have yeah. it. And I and I found that when people have that, though, and I've, I know a lot of people have had these types of dreams and like. You know, I could just feel the love. You could feel that they're okay. It's that it's that reassurance that they're okay, um, that that we're going to be okay. Um, but it's interesting because we a lot of times people will take those positive dreams to be a visit, but then the negative dreams will say, "Well, that was just a dream." But is there something to be learned from the negative dreams also? Of course, yeah. Well, first is using discernment, right? Some people who, as I said, will take those dreams as a visit also depending on where they're, where they are in yeah. the grief. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's just really understanding, like when we call things a dream visit, it's just really understanding that that actually complicates a lot of things for people in many different forms. And just for, before I go on the, the negative dreams, mm -hmm. people just in my own research, when you look at, you know, who are having these dreams, like that was one of the common concerns that why I started the research was, you know, why is some people having these dreams and other people aren't. And so the spiritual people would always put themselves down if they haven't had a dream. Mm -hmm. right? They'll be jealous of others. Mm -hmm. They'd say, oh, maybe he didn't cross over properly. Maybe he's mad at me because I had to like maybe sell the house or something yeah. or I couldn't give him that type of funeral he wanted. Or maybe, you know, the afterlife is they forgot, they forgot about me kind of thing. And so I wanted to give a scientific explanation to sort of understand it a little bit more. And so what I found in, in replicating the research is that dream recall was the most important factor. So mm. what it's saying is that people who remember more dreams in general remember more of these types of dreams. Wow. I think that's interesting. And for a lot of people, when you start asking them if they didn't have a dream, you know, what their recall rate is, usually it's pretty bad and pretty poor. Yeah. And so yeah. I usually connect the dots for them. And for them, you could see this weight goes off them because all those reasons, negative reasons where they put on it, yeah. it are now sort of this valid. And now because of the research, people can hold on to that and say, oh, like I just didn't remember maybe the dream that I, I did have. Yeah. But within that study, so in both studies, I looked at spirituality. Because a lot of people thought, so I wasn't going to put it in, but people sort of made me put it in, uh -huh. and thought that people who are spiritual will have more of these dreams. I guess it's a good theory. Anyways, it's not true. So people who are spiritual or not are both having similar dream experiences. Yeah. The difference is, is in the content. So maybe in a spiritual person, they'll talk about the afterlife or they'll talk about, you know, I don't know what heaven looks like or what death is like, something like mm -hmm. that. Where in people who are not spiritual, they won't, but they still have that loving quality. They'll even say they're okay. Like they still have those kind of comments. They'll still say that they love them, mm -hmm. but they just won't have that other stuff in it. So, you know, but for those people, what I, I want to sort of mention, you know, why when we label these as maybe a dream visit to some, how it can put off others. Because if you're not spiritual, your guard and your wall goes up the moment mm -hmm. you hear it's a visit and you don't want to share those experiences anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I really try to get people to understand that, you know, there, it's the quality of the dream, I think the most important to ask and then ask how they feel about it. Because some people, based on their culture, religion, that is not, um, that mm. would be frowned upon in many ways right, to call right. it a dream visit, right? But it's a great moment together. And whatever you call that, living in the mystery of that moment. And that in itself can allow people to share these a little bit more freely because most people hide them if they don't get asked. And yeah. I think that's why people thought it was rare. But, you know, for a spiritual person, they'll let you know right away if they think it's a visit because, you know, like they'll say just the wording they use. And I think that's beautiful. And I always I never discourage that because mm -hmm. I've seen it even in my research how these dreams help people believe more in an afterlife and help people regain their faith, which is really rocky after someone dies, mm -hmm. to understand sort of like how could this happen? And so you sort of see how it is beneficial to people. And when it comes to these negative dreams, these dreams has been shown just in my research when they're distressing, that they relate to trauma symptoms and they also relate to um, unresolved feelings of guilt or blame. Mm -hmm. And so a good example of this is just understanding like dreams represent our waking life. So um, a good example was a, a widow, her said like her husband died and she had this dream, a repeated dream of her husband coming to the door um, and telling her that he's still alive. And then, you know, basically wants to get back together with her. 
but she says, oh, no, I'm dating someone new. I, I can't. And she's like, how can you still be alive? Like, how could you make me think that you're dead? Hmm. And you're like, how could you be such a mean and heartless person to do something like that to me? And then he said, you know, like, the mo he's like, then he's like, well, if we're not going to be, be together, well, then uh, give me all the money that you inherited. Then I'll leave you alone. And she she said no. And then um, he began to chase her. And so hmm. she had this repeated dream over and over again. She thought it was a negative visitation. And then when you start asking about these points in the dream that are, you'd say, are, are important, the one is getting back together and her being mm -hmm. in a relationship. And so that's one of the issues, right? Like how difficult it is for someone who has a partner die and then to start a new relationship. Like you're, right. you're, you're, you're trying to love two people at the same time. And right. it's very difficult in our culture because it's always been frowned upon. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, for them, like you have to sort of figure that out. And then you have the difficulty of the other partner. Are they even, do they even want to know about your the partner that died? Are they right. even, you know, is it, or are you hiding your, your love to make them, you know, feel better kind of thing? Right, exactly. And it's a very difficult position to be in. And then on top of that, you have this money. So when you ask her about the money, she said the most, the hardest thing after the death was actually accepting the money because he worked so hard for it. And she felt it was so unjust that he worked so hard and she's the one that gets suspended or keep mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so she's sort of working through that still. And she's spending some of that money on the new relationship. So mm -hmm. it, you see that there's this complex thing going on and the mind's trying to say, you know, you got to work through this because right. whatever you're doing isn't working. Right. And because a dream is repeated like that, it is a, fl a flag that, you know, there is something that you're not getting in waking life. The, the mind's really good. If you're not going to get it, it'll tell you again, either in the same way or in a different story. Right. If you track your dreams over, you know, over you know, weeks, you can sort of really see if you're making progress or not based on the Ugh, themes that I've are coming up. Strange, I've been having the same dream for years. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Well, there's something important there, right? And these dreams can trigger, you know, especially your feelings can trigger certain dreams. And mm -hmm. there's probably clues in there to, to help you understand that because they're not like, I don't feel the random at all. They're yeah. really telling a story to us to really help us be more healthy and waking life. Yeah, I want to reiterate a couple of things you said, because you said some really profound things there that I really want to make sure the listeners heard. One is when people say I'm not having these dream visits, there's something wrong with me. My loved one's mad at me or this. I don't we don't have the connection or whatever. I, I think it's really important, to, like you said, to ask how many dreams are you recalling in general? And that the fact that there's a correlation there. So hopefully that'll take a lot of pressure off of some people. And there are ways that we can improve our dream recall, as you said, by valuing it, by journaling. Uh, I think setting an attention. I've heard people say, I, I want to have a dream, you know, just just maybe triggering that subconscious thing. I wanna, but I also wanted to ask you about, you know, you had this visit or this dream with your father. I, I Using the visit word, we had this dream with your father <laughs> and it changed your life. What was your yeah. belief in the afterlife before that? Did it change that or what were your, what were your thoughts about that? Yeah, I don't know. It was very interesting because when I look back at that, I am spiritual. But when I look back, like I wasn't asking for a dream um, at that time. And I think I was still developing my my faith in mm -hmm. many ways, as I still am, I guess, um, mm -hmm. trying to understand this crazy world and then uh, and understand myself. As, as I learn more about myself, my idea of God or whatever changes significantly. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, you know, I, when I even look at that dream, I don't even, I don't think I ever even classified it as a visitation. It was just a dream that changed me. And I still mm -hmm. look, look back. I'm like, I don't even, would I even say it's a visitation? I don't know because it was just something that changed. I didn't put a, it wasn't a interpretation. I don't think I've ever really put an interpretation on that dream per se. It was just me. It was just how crazy it was. It changed me. And that love, it's a thing that I keep right. the most. And like, I don't, like at the end of the day, I don't know. Right. Like, it's like, and I don't know if it really even matters to me. But that I but I what I do know for certain is that dream changed me. And so what can I learn from that dream as I move forward? And it's just really, I think what's possible when it comes to love. And so my goal has not been trying to prove the afterlife is real. You know, really it, it is or it isn't, I'm gonna die and it's gonna happen or not. Like it's not like yeah. my belief isn't gonna determine anything. And so and so, but what can I do now? I'm like, okay, I can learn what's possible for a human. And I think that there are different levels of love. And mm -hmm. if I can dream a scene like that or an emotion like that, why can't I live that in waking life? And so that's always been my goal moving forward is try to get to that place in waking life um, mm -hmm. 
and not just need a dream to get me there. Like I'm really working hard to really try to understand, you know, myself, who I am, what stresses me out, what am I attached to, and what's holding me back from love. And a lot of people, you know, I'd say like we do get attached to these experiences because they make us feel good. But then when we go to waking life, we're like, I just want another one rather than saying, you know what? Yeah. What can I do to increase the chances I can actually have that while I'm awake? Yeah. I think that's where I'm at. It's just, it's less about, you know, what is after and more about what can I do now? And a lot of these dreams that people share, they have so much wisdom that I gain from them. So that's why I love asking about these dreams because there's so much you can take from it mm -hmm. um, when it comes to what love is and the words that they say there. It's just very remarkable um, for um, where I'm sitting to be able to utilize these dreams as a way to rethink what life is and how to process how I see myself as I move forward. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about, I don't, I don't know if you've even heard of this phenomenon or not, but I've heard of people that where someone will be deceased and someone else will have a dream where they'll come and visit them and tell them they're okay before anybody even knows this person has been deceased. Have you, have you heard about this happening? This is where it gets really wild when it comes to these <laughs> these dreams, because even on my website, there's these dreams. I, I put these people who can have these dreams, as you said, before they even know the person's dead. And I think there is something very beautiful about that. And to allow people to sit in mystery, there's a lot about life we don't know. And to think that we do know, even to think that we know what the afterlife is, is just, I think, insane in itself. Because we just don't know, mm -hmm. but we do know that, like, for to, to believe that there is one, okay. But to understand what it's like, I don't know if we can even conceive of what that is with right, right, with our minds, right. And so, there's a lot of times we have to sit in the mystery of life and to understand that we may be wrong in different ways, but there's certain things that you can be certain of. Anyway, so these dreams really make you sit in that mystery because they're having dreams very similar to what someone would have after they know of the death. Mm -hmm. So the person somehow at that moment knows of the loss. And that could be so like some people would say, oh, that's uh, they visited them in the dream. And so they let them know that they basically died and they're going to be OK. So that's one possibility. The other is, let's say, if you're not spiritual, there must be a connection that people have that goes beyond time or in space that people just know. And I hear that with like, you know, parents with their children. They just know something's wrong. They almost mm -hmm. have this like radar and they call and something is. And so there could be these strings of just of of attachment and then love that allows us to know when you know someone has died too so either way whatever the possibility it changes the way we understand human beings just by the occurrence of that yeah. and other times when it comes to i think some other dreams you're saying about people having dreams for others i think that is a really fascinating topic and i i collected a lot and people came on my podcast and talked about it it's more rare but someone could have a dream that's actually meant for someone else in the sense that the mm -hmm. character in the dream, so the deceased will tell them to share a message with yeah. their father or their mother or whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a person doesn't even really even know, or really is that close to mm -hmm. that individual. And so it takes a lot of courage for someone to have a dream and then share it because it could end up really someone calling you crazy. They just don't believe you and stuff like that. But for the most part, a lot of people have said the powerful impact it has on others and a lot of times they never had that dream themselves. So it's very interesting when you start looking at that. And that's more research that needs to be done on that topic, because it does change the way we we see ourselves and like what's possible with us. And, and there's just so much more we just don't understand. We're trying to, like, I guess, go on Mars and land on Mars. And we don't really even understand our, like what we are capable of. Right. Like it's, just, it's very interesting how we keep pushing the boundaries externally, but internally, it's still really similar to where it was prior. Yeah, well, these are some of the reasons that I believe there's something more to it than just our, our subconscious is, you know, that that phenomenon I've heard of happening, if not often, but it happens where people will, will dream about someone else being deceased before they even know. And if you, you just mentioned another one. Well, it's like, it's almost like the, they can't get through to the one that they're trying to get through to. So they'll go to the cousin or the aunt or the neighbor down the street even. <laughs> And say, and the, and the neighbor will come up and say, you know, I had a dream about your your daughter last night. I, I barely knew her, but she came to me and came to tell me to tell you that she's okay. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. And it's beautiful when people said have the courage to be able to actually share that. And I do want to sort of mention when we said we talk about some of these, you know, positive dreams. There is a there is a category that should be of concern and for anyone who works with the bereaved, and that's a theme called "Come Join Me." And mm. here, so kids can have this, it seems, um, and then also adults, but it's where the deceased is either dragging the dreamer basically to the afterlife wow. or 
the dream or the deceased is trying to convince the individual to basically kill themselves to join them in the afterlife. And it's a very positive scene in the sense of what the person, how the person's interacting with the individual. But these are really rare, but they seem to sort of point to mental health issues and yeah. suicide ideation. And so, you know, in my studies, I sort of saw how it, people who had those types of dream had really high forms of trauma symptoms. And then there's been other people that it's highly related to complicated grief. And you see it even across cultures with the indigenous uh, people in Torja. And so their thing is if someone ever has that type of dream, means they're going to die soon. That's the myth. And mm -hmm. so I think any if you're in a hunter-gatherer society, if you're dealing with trauma, you're not going to be, um, your memory is going to be off, your cognition is going to be off, and reaction time. So you, I can see you slipping. Or it could be that they, you know, they do kill themselves also. And I, and I, you know, when people, when we, when we say ask about these dreams and understand where it is, because if you take, if you tell someone, you know, these are dream visits, right? All of a sudden that person will say, oh, then I'm supposed to kill myself to go to the afterlife because it is a positive dream. That's what right. we really have to ask, you know, what's the dream before we label it just to know it, will that complicate the individual's bereavement in any way? And what are their beliefs? And so, you know, with that, I can, I can definitely see people probably have taken their life because of some of these dreams because they believed it was what they were supposed to do. And in grief, you know, like our cognition is not the greatest. Like we, our impulse control and reaction time in the sense of what we do. I was about to go to Israel and like drop out of school, right? So if I had one of those dreams, how easy it is, you know, for someone to just take that next step because they believe the dream was telling them the truth. And so just being aware that there's, I said like there's so many types of dreams that I've seen that I think I am in a privileged position to understand the landscape, which, you know, that's why I'm really trying to talk about this stuff because a lot of people only hear certain aspects and a lot of them are these positive dreams and that's beautiful and it's great, but there's also right. this other landscape that hasn't been talked about. And that's sort of the importance of understanding and using discernment when we sort of talk about these dreams and how people's beliefs in, uh, in how they interpret their dreams affect the grief journey. Yeah, th that's some really excellent, another uh, excellent point you, you made there about that. Um, you know, because it's interesting as, as you were telling your your path, uh, how you were doing one thing in your undergrad and you decided to go into psychology and go into dream research. My my daughter, when when my other when Shana passed away, my daughter Kayla was uh, in the medical. She was on a, a path to become a phys physician's assistant. And after Shana passed, she realized this is not really what I want to do. So she she changed. She made she majored uh, in psychology in her undergrad and then hey. to get her, 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 her master's in mental health counseling. Wow. So, you know, it's interesting that like when we're in grief, we have to be careful about making big decisions because we don't, our cognition is not great, but also it can actually put us on the path that I think that we're meant to be on. I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll use that. I think that, I think that, yeah. you know, and, and you took this dream that you had from your father and, and, and you said, okay, this, this changed your life. It changed, you know, your life yeah. work. And every people might've heard of this, um, and I was looking at your website before I got on. So I'll give you, you know, but I'd heard it before too about Paul McCartney um, after his mother passed and everybody knows the song, let it be. And there's a line in the song, you know, mother Mary comes to me and everybody assumes this is the virgin mother, but Paul McCartney had a dream of his mother after she passed coming to him. And the lyrics are when I find myself in times of trouble, mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she's standing right in front of me speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Whisper words of wisdom, and and that that song is just so profound. And as he's relating this this dream to James Carville, like fifty years later, not James Carville, um, what's the guy's name? Uh, Cor James Corden. Corden. James Corden. Yeah, as, as you're relating it to him, fifty years later, you know, you can see him tearing up. I mean, you can see that 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 dream still impacts him to this day. So there's, I think there's yeah. something very profound about about these these dreams. Well, I, I hear from a lot of people, they'll utilize, they still remember these dreams, you know, 40, 50 years later, and they still remember how it feels like that feeling of love can still be, you know, they can still look back at that and carry that with them in many ways. And it provides them that comfort as they move forward. And for a lot of times, it's that thing that actually, when I mean, people look back, it can be that thing that really helped them work through their grief in many ways. I've had, you know, people that were about to kill themselves, have a dream with the deceased, you know, talking them out of it. Um, people who are, you know, addicted, had a dream and it changed them. And so like, you can see like the significant moments and of people's grief journey change because of these dreams. That's why like, it's really interesting how a lot of people don't share them. There wasn't any research on them 
because we're like, oh, people are just resilient. Well, it could be they're also having these dreams that are helping them become resilient and mm-hmm. to work through some of the stuff outside of, let's say, you know, traditional means. And I think, you know, that is a very beautiful quality of these dreams. And it's like, why shouldn't we? We should know as much as we can, because it seems that there is some type of inner knowing or knowledge that is guiding us to how to work through grief. And mm-hmm. if we can understand the concept of what's going on, we could work and help people a lot better in waking life because they're said there's so much wisdom. Even they said Paul McCartney, let it be. Like I remember hearing that, I was so shocked because I, I was in love with that song. And now I'm like, wow, like that makes it even more beautiful. Yeah. And the way he said like, and and there's so many. So even on my website, griefdreams.ca, there's so many other points in movies and tv shows that capture these dreams when i started looking and i started like starting like every day every time i look at a movie or or it comes up i'm going to write down and like the amount of um shows and and places where i've seen these dreams you can tell it's affecting a lot of people that they're putting it in their movies and mm-hmm. they're putting in their tv shows in ways that are capturing the importance and the the beauty of the topic for the most part there are a couple that will put in negative dreams and I think that's beautiful too, because it just showcases and raises awareness. But the beauty of these dreams help change people. I remember one of my, just on a side note, one of my favorite movies growing up was Braveheart. And one of the reasons was my dad's favorite movie was Braveheart too. So we always watched it together. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I never realized until I was in my master's program, I, I put the movie on again. And there's three grief dreams in there of him mm-hmm. dreaming of his deceased wife. And I, I think that's probably the record. I haven't seen more than three right now, <laughs> but mm-hmm. but like I go, how interesting that is. One of my favorite movies that I was tied mm-hmm. to actually had these experiences, and I didn't even realize it. wasn't conscious of it until after I started, you know, looking for these around. And I think you know, there's something to say about that, and I think there's something special about that. Just in my own journey, where I look back and like mm-hmm. my dad's tied to these dreams. It's not just I had my own, but it was in one of our favorite movies that we had together. That is wild. That is really cool. So tell me about what you offer to people. I know you've got a, you've got a course, you do one-on-one work. So tell me about what you offer. So to raise awareness, I, like I was doing, you know, before the pandemic, I was doing a lot of talks and workshops. And so that kind of stopped. And so I decided to do an online course. And so it's nine and a half hours that someone could take. And it really helps you understand, you know, some stuff on sleep dreams, but you know, the majority it's on grief dreams Mm -hmm. and all the landscape, like we, so what we talked about an hour. So it's probably another nine hours of like conversation on the topic that we just didn't go into because right. it's so vast mm-hmm. in, in the sense of what's there. So if someone wants to learn more and wants to talk about these more, I think that's a great starting point. You get a certificate at the end of it. And then, you know, for those people who, you know, have these negative dreams or just want to talk more about these dreams, I offer the one-on-one grief dreams consulting and just, you know, it's it just, it's sad. There's not a lot of people that know the information. So I'm just trying to help people the best I can mm-hmm. understand how a lot of their, a lot of, clients that have negative dreams and so it's really you know how it applies to waking life and what it's trying to teach us to move forward um, with that and then you said like i got the grief dreams podcast so people who want to know more about the just want to hear more of these stories like that's the place to go because a lot of the people that come on majority of them have really positive life-changing experiences and i i think that's phenomenal even the last guest we had on was zingara and she talked about, you know, meeting her, I think it was her grandfather, and she asked about the afterlife. And then he told her what the afterlife was like. And I kind of think that's kind of cool in the sense of these answers and questions people have about life, they they can get from the deceased too. So yeah, I, I, I love what you're you're saying. And it and it's interesting because I've I've studied near-death experiences to a fair amount. And the grief dreams remind me of that without the trauma. You know, you can have some of these experiences. And I also love the way you put it, you know, you don't have to believe it's the afterlife, you might believe it's inner wisdom or the subconscious, whatever, whatever works for you. Yeah. But there is there is you cannot deny the wisdom of it. You cannot yeah. deny the, the message of it, the, the, the beauty of it, and the way that it, it can transform, you know, people's lives. So I think the work that you're doing is just so, so very important. And I love just a you know, short amount of time we've been able to spend together today. I've learned a lot, you know, in, in terms of there are types of dreams I didn't know. I didn't know about the come with me, you know, dream, yeah. um, you know, how maybe we can interpret these negative dreams. I thought you got a, a great, great example of that woman, you know, with the, with her husband and and the the, the other person in the life. And it's gotta be a really, fr- you know, complex situation. You said trying to, you know, honor your one that's on the other side, but live your life while you're still here. So 
seeing that come through in the dream and being able to understand what, what the dream is trying to tell you. Um, so I, it's all just amazing. It, it absolutely is. And that's why I love talking about it. And one thing we didn't mention is how these dreams change over time. So after yeah. you work through your grief and like, so it's not really, your dreams aren't about grief anymore. And these dreams of the seas will pop up in times of other um, needs that you have and, and times of suffering. Mm-hmm. So let's say if you get divorced or something you may have, or you know, something tragic happens, you may have one of these dreams and it's been 10 years since the individual died, but they're offering you support and comfort. I've seen a lot in the pandemic now, which is very interesting of how the deceased are coming to offer support in many different ways, either just being together to reduce the isolation or to provide them um, questions or asking how they're doing mm-hmm. in the pandemic. And then at end of life, which is interesting, you'll, you'll start seeing these dreams again and they're basically helping people transition from life to death. So they're providing a lot of comfort for the individual in those final final days. And I think it's, I think that's one of the other really unique things of this research or just this topic is that, you know, it's not just one dream at one moment of life. It's right. like once it happens, it keeps happening in certain moments of your life that are very important. And so like, why, did, why is that? And, and how come we don't have those dreams prior? Like, I don't know, like, but it is, there's a lot of mystery and a lot of research that still needs to be done. So hopefully people um, know it's a safe space now to, I think, explore uh, research wise. I think, you know, that's maybe one of the reasons why people didn't do research prior because it was really mm-hmm. tied with the afterlife a lot. But I think mm-hmm. it did a really good job to say, no, like everyone's having these, let's just talk about the subject in a non-judgmental way. And people can take it as they want, you know, like, I'm not, as long as it's comforting, you know, like, I don't really care what you take it as. It's when it's distressing, you know, let's work on that because that's going to cause you yeah. to um, limit what you can do and where you can go with your healing. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned something that I I, I take it a note and I, I hadn't brought it up, but I guess we have a couple more minutes. So I do want to get into it because my father-in-law at, near the end of his life had dementia and he would, he would talk about all these things, crazy, like dreamlike things. So my theory was he had lost the, the separation between dream life and real life. I'm like, I don't know what was going on with him, but it seemed, but when he would talk about people in his fantasies, they were always deceased, like mm-hmm. consistently. There were always people who were, were deceased. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting observation. I did not make it at the time. Um, but later on, as I look back on, I'm like, it seemed to me like he was like tapping into the other side as he got, as he got closer to the end. Yeah. And that, you know, there's research that's been done, a lot of research coming out of uh, Hospice Buffalo with uh, Dr. Kerr and Dr. Pay Grant that are really looking at these end of life dreams and visions. And it's very hard to separate the two at end of life because their sleep is so sporadic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, same thing. So they're having these dream experiences and sometimes it could be the dream experiences tied into waking life. So it becomes a vision. But yeah, they're there and they tend their research found that there's tend to be an increase in these as they approach the end. And so that in itself is just, it's very fascinating to me on, you know, how these continue to support us and why can't we have them every day? Like, why do they show up just at quote unquote random? I don't know. And I think, you know, that's, that's a, one of those mysteries that you just have to sort of sit with and be patient. And I think if anything, like we teach our kids to be patient, I guess these dreams teach us to be patient as adults. Yeah, well, you know, it's it, it, even the whole the word afterlife, you know, because what it, to me, what it says is consciousness is something that is bigger than we understand. It just it's it's not just mm-hmm. in our brains. It, there's something that's that's everything. It's undeniable. We're somehow connected to something larger than ourselves or to each other in some ways that we don't understand from a, a material's point of view. And I, I love the way you're going about it academically. It's not a matter of faith. It's not a matter of I have to believe this but also not to shy away from the fact that these things are actually happening. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you like that. Right. Some people uh, may uh, frown upon some of the stuff I'm doing and I've, I've just because of their belief system and what they sort of see these dreams to be. And so, yeah, it's just, you know, the, the love and support that, you know, you give for allowing me to be on your platform and then everyone else, I just sort of thank you all for continuing to raise awareness on the subject. Cause it's just so important to my heart, but I know, it's a, impacting a lot of people just around the world. And I think for me to do research that's affecting the world is such a, a place of, I'm in such a place of gratitude because most people, their research never gets read. And for this to have an opportunity to actually change the way we support people, you know, and just a, a matter of doing a master's and PhD, I think that's just a remarkable part of where I'm sitting at that like, you know, like the legacy of just my father is, is actually moving through the world. Yeah. Um, and for me, like that, that means a lot. 
Yeah, that, that's very, very cool. Well, I want to tell people where they can reach you. Uh, it's Dr. Joshua Black, and he's at griefdreams.ca. Um, so you can find uh, more uh, questions and answers on his website. The course is available there. Um, you're available for one-to-one consulting. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm so thrilled to put this episode out. I think it's a really important episode that'll help a lot of people. Hey, well, I'm happy about that. And thank you again for, for having me on. I really appreciate you valuing the topic. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Sweet dreams, eh? Hopefully you get another <laughs> one of those dreams tonight. Yeah, really. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Grief to Growth. Brian hopes that you find this episode helpful and will come back for future episodes. Brian's best-selling book, Grief to Growth, Planted Not Buried, is a great resource for anyone who is coping with grief or knows someone who is. If you enjoy the podcast and would like to support it, there are three things you can do to help. The first is to share the podcast with someone that you think it will help. The second is to go to iTunes, rate, and review the episode. The third way you can support the podcast is by becoming a patron. Head over to www.patreon.com slash grief to growth. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash grief, the number two, growth, and sign up to make a small monthly donation. Patrons get access to exclusive bonus content and knowledge that you are helping to spread the message of grief to growth. For more about Brian and Grief to Growth, visit www.grieftogrowth.com. Hi there. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of the podcast, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. What questions came up for you? What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? I invite you to visit us at grieftogrowth.circle.so. That's grief, the number two, growth.circle.so to continue the conversation with me and with other listeners. It's a space to sound off, to share reactions, and to go deeper into the topics from the show. I look forward to chatting more, and I hope to see you there.